Greetings. Welcome to the first Origins Institute talk in the 2022-2023 academic year. My name is John Stone, or Doc Rock. I'm the director for the Origins Institute and your host. We're recording the proceedings and we'll make the video available for sharing. We'll hold a brief question and answer period after the talk. Well, all, we already have received over 30 questions by email, which our speaker generously has perused and we'll try to address during the talk. Please input any remaining or new questions in the Q&A chat box. We'll address as many questions as we time will allow after the talk. Before the introduction, I'd like to relay a little bit of information. The Origins Institute is one among five research centers and institutes in the Faculty of Science and 70 in total at McMaster University. These research centers and institutes discover solutions to complicated problems by bringing together interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and in our case, transdisciplinary teams. These teams collaborate with academic, government, and industry partners, and you. We are collaborating at this very moment. Community outreach and engagement is a priority for research centers and institutes at McMaster University, which is why we host talks in collaboration with the McMaster Alumni Association. We sincerely appreciate the entire McMaster Alumni Association from the team that provides great technical support for our events to members like you and our guests. We continue to showcase the Origins Institute mandate with talks this year, highlighting our original institute themes and prime research directive. Tonight, the origin of space-time theme. Our guest will deliver an exciting talk providing a brief history of black holes. Hari Kunduri earned a PhD from the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Kundari then held a three-year fellowship at Nottingham and Cambridge, a two-year fellowship at the University of Alberta, and then a faculty position at Memorial University of Newfoundland. McMaster University proverbially saw the light and pulled Hari to be in our midst. Professor Kunduri's current research concerns mathematical and theoretical aspects of black holes within the framework of general relativity and its extensions in string theory. We are excited to welcome Professor Hari Kunduri to McMaster University and the Origins Institute for what is sure to be an attractive, deeply absorbing talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was a very, very kind introduction. I'd especially like to thank the Origin Institute for the invitation. Uh, and John in particular, because he's been uh, communicating with me through all my questions and so on about the talk. Um, but the first thing I like to say about the Origins Institute is when I heard about it a few years ago, I, I kind of laughed because I'm so cynical, you see, and I thought there's no way people actually ask these big questions. You know, it's just these profs, they get together once in a while, they, you know, they ask these really interesting questions and they go back and do their usual dry work and, you know, get their students jobs and their postdocs positions and all these things. And I saw a talk over the summer by uh, Professor Paul Higgs in the physics department about the origins of life, about RNA, and it sort of blew my mind. So it's really amazing what kind of work uh, people are doing. And I guess talking about speculative work, here we talk about uh, black holes. So I'll just give a quick overview of what we'll be doing today. I'll make sure I don't go on too long. Um, so black holes are mathematical mathematical predictions of Einstein's theory uh, theory of relativity, as you guys probably know. But now we have direct evidence that they actually exist. So that's quite remarkable. And I've already sort of given the game away by this picture. This is M87. Uh, so this is a black hole, maybe five billion, six billion times the size of the mass of the sun, in a galaxy far away from us. I think some like 50 million light years away. Uh, and somehow people managed to take a picture of it very recently using the Event Horizon Telescope. Now, the really cool thing about black holes is that everybody gets a piece of the action. So there's people who are interested perhaps in mathematics and geometry like, like myself who are inspired by black holes and we find many interesting questions. And indeed I have colleagues in the math department here in uh, McMaster who, who study these things. Meanwhile, there's sort of theoretical physicists coming at it from things like string theory and loop quantum gravity and so on, who are also interested in black holes. And then there's people who actually do real experiments, God forbid, uh, astronomers and astrophysicists, people who study gravitational waves, and they're actually finding hard evidence of black holes. So you see, they're they're quite they 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 drive research in many areas. And I hope I get that across uh, in my talk today. Although, of course, my own work is sort of hyper focused kind of on, on geometry and so on. So the most important thing to anyone who's ever given a talk is let me give you a quick piece of advice. It's not about me, it's about 
you, why aren't you doing something else today, like spending time with friends or watching the Jays Yankees game or something? What's in it for you? So what I'll talk about today is perhaps a bit ambitious. I want to explain to you what GR really is. So not just some pop science, ha ha ha, waving pictures at it, but try to get you a feel of what's going on and why we use geometry to study this stuff. And I hope you, when you walk away from this, you get at least an idea, some geometry. And I'll send you where black holes come out of this. And then I'll discuss what I want to discuss, which are these black hole no hair theorems. So these are theorems. Now, some mathematicians might quibble with that word theorem because there's some jumps in there, small ones, but they're, at least they're clearly stated. Uh, and what impact that has on big questions that come up in theoretical physics, like the information paradox and quantum entanglement and other things you've probably heard about before. Okay, so let me uh, jump into it. Now, the first thing I want to get away with is, is a little side. And that's something I always say when I, I give these talks. Many people are maybe familiar with Paul Dirac. He was a famous uh, British theoretical physicist, you know, along the lines of Newton, Maxwell, Hawking, you know, one of the greatest theoretical physicists who ever lived. And Dirac said that to make progress in science, one should, you know, use experiment, obviously, but also mathematical reasoning. He was, you know, a mathematical physicist. And he said that progress would be characterized by increasing beauty. So what the heck does that mean, increasing beauty? It's very subjective, you know, it's sort of beyond rational critique. And this actually seems to work. And at least up to now, the history of theoretical physics has been moving towards a more natural, aesthetically pleasing structure, in particular, one might think of Maxwell's equations, which sort of combine the, the forces, electro, electro, ah, the electro, electromagnetic forces and um, sorry, electricity and magnetism. So I've already combined them in my mind already. It's hard for me to split them up. So in the 1860s, Maxwell realized you could put these two different forces in the same envelope under the same umbrella. Okay, and when you do this, that opens up new avenues of understanding new things that come from that. So it's really brilliant. All right, so unfortunately, there's one little drawback of this, and I often like to you know, give an example to music. So our ears are tuned to understand music. So you don't need to be able to read music or play music to appreciate it. You would be listening to this piece of music for you know, 200 plus years, but imagine if in, you turn on the radio and instead you just hear someone doing a play-by-play and they just say, well, we're in the key of, I don't know, E flat or C sharp major. And we begin with three Gs. You know, you would just cry and you say, this goes on for 50 minutes. And you just shut it off immediately. So that's a bit like my talk. So I hope you don't shut it off immediately. But many of the ideas, which are so beautiful, apparently I'll tell you, will not look very beautiful because I had to describe them to you in terms of analogies and things, which is a bit like trying to describe music. Uh, but there's another thing I was thinking about recently about music. Which, which made me think about research in general in these sorts of fields. And something Dirac was getting at is like, what is mathematical beauty? It's highly aesthetic, but it's a way of, think of it as a way of generating hypotheses. Um, like obviously to go beyond what you know, you have to move into some area in a domain which is beyond your understanding. So in a sense that is irrational, right? So it's beyond reason in a sense. So how do you, how do you attack that? Well, the only way really is to use our instinct or or what you might say a hunch, or is this some kind of uh, a sense of aesthetics that might guide you towards what you might call intuition. So it's not pure reason, but it's something else. And this is, well, if you do things in this point of view, you see it's actually, you're seeing the whole thing at once instead of zooming in on one little thing, instead of zooming in on just this little piece of music, this little bar, these three notes, you have to, to understand the greatness of this piece, which is of course you guys will know Da, 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 da. It's, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. You have to, you think about the whole, that bar as it features within the melody, as it features within the movement and within that symphony, within all the symphonies that, you know, Beethoven produced and that within the whole scheme of classical music and Baroque music and, you know, neoclassical and the whole thing. So when you understand this thing in its totality, you, you, you accept the beauty of it. So this sounds kind of crazy. And then you'll think, well, then you can do anything the hell you want, right? However, mathematics gives a very rigid framework for this kind of raw speculation. So you can't do anything too crazy because you have to be mathematically consistent and anything you do has to agree with all the stuff that came before, right? So that's why I think mathematics has been so useful in the study of understanding nature because it gives you a rigid 
structure in which to construct hypotheses, not theories, but just hypotheses, just a hunch. And anyone, you know, many scientists, I'm sure John would agree, when you write a research proposal or something, you have to try to explain in some rational way why you're going to do something. Why is someone going to give you money to do some research? And a lot of times there is no, re you can't really reason it. You just have a hunch. You just, well, it fits a pattern. There's some reason why I think it should work like this, but you can't say that. So you spend all the time trying to find out reasons to justify why you're doing something, but really it could just be a hunch or just a feeling that an intuition that you know something is true. And oftentimes that points towards the truth. Okay, so now I will try to explain to you a relativity after my long diatribe. So in fact, relativity isn't something new. Galileo already realized this and is the concept of Galilean re relativity, which everyone will recognize. So suppose someone's in a train and fires a beam of light. The train is moving at the speed V. So someone just watching the train go by will say, well, the speed of light is C. The train is moving at speed V, so I'll measure the speed to be C plus V. That's common sense, right? And that is the that is a principle of relativity, which is built into you know, Newtonian mechanics and what Galileo thought as the law of motion. So that this is like relativity isn't something Einstein created. It's simply how to relate measurements with respect to one person to someone else who's in maybe a different reference frame. You know, like take a walk in my shoes, literally. How do you see this from your perspective? That's just rules for moving between these frames. Okay, so let's move to Einstein. And what people realized in the late 19th century is, well, the Earth is moving. So suppose you look at a distant star, sometimes the Earth might be moving towards it, and then other times, you know, we're going around the sun, so we're going to be moving away from it. So if you take a distant star, let's pick a fixed one, you should be able to see the speed of light being sort of faster and slower depending on how we move around it. I'm, I'm describing it very schematically, but this is the Nicholson-Morley experiment. You can look it up online. This Wikipedia Nicholson-Morley experiment. What they found is that the speed of light was the same no matter where, how you were pointed towards it. So this sort of was a bedrock underlying theme of ideas which led Einstein to his 1905 special relativity theory. And amongst other things in that theory, he stated that the speed of light is constant and measured to be the same for all observers, no matter how they're moving relative to the source of that light. So back to my other example, even the person watching the train go by, she will still measure that speed to be C, even though the train looks like it's moving, moving at speed V. So something has to be going on with the laws of mechanics to make both people measure the same speed C. Okay, so the laws have to be slightly changed. And indeed, the laws of special relativity slightly modify Newtonian mechanics in small ways that aren't useful in everyday life, because most things don't move at everyday life, things don't move at near the speed of light. So you won't really see this. Okay, so obviously, but you can detect these things. Now, moving on quite quickly, Einstein then turned to the theory of gravity. Now everyone knows gravity. There's a force of gravity proportional to the size of the masses, say M1 and M2, like say M1 is the mass of the sun, M2 is the mass of the, of the earth, and they have an attractive force. That's why there's a minus sign here, where you can see that mouse. And that force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between things. So the farther away you are, the weaker the force. Makes complete sense. And uh, we sort of understood how gravity works. And there's the apple falling on Newton's head in Cambridge or Grantham, which is where he probably lived, I think, not always in Cambridge. So here's the question for you. Does gravity act instantaneously? Or does it take time? Because we, if Einstein is right, nothing is traveling faster than the speed of light. And that's a constant for everyone. How fast does gravity travel? So here's a experiment for you. The sun is eight light minutes away, okay? So it takes eight minutes for a signal from the sun to, to hit us, to hit our eyes on the earth. So let's just say the sun disappeared right now. We wouldn't know about it for eight minutes because it takes time for the signal to reach us. And we say, hey, wait, there's no sun. And then we suddenly freeze and go and flying off in some crazy tangential direction, right? As we move around the sun. If the sun just disappeared, we'd, there'd be no more force of gravity and we'd be a lot colder, apparently, okay? which would be a big problem. Uh, or if this, would it happen instantaneously? So these are the sort of questions Einstein was interested in between 1905 and 1915 and about a 10 year period. So he, he, he was very famous at these thought experiments they're called Gedanken experiments because Denken in German means to think. So Gedanken is sort of like thought. And uh, Einstein thought of this. Imagine there's Newton here in the left picture and he's on the earth in this little cubicle here, like an elevator, 
closed off. He drops an apple, the apple falls to the ground. So I thought, well, imagine if I was in an elevator and I'm accelerating up, say, at 9.8 meters per second squared, and you drop an apple. Well, as far as you know, you don't really know you're out in space, accelerating, you're all like closed off. And all you see is this apple looks like it falls to your feet and it's accelerating downwards. So Einstein said those two things should be indistinguishable. That's sort of the basis of his general theory of relativity. Okay, so those two things should be physically indistinguishable. And in a sense, they are at least locally. Okay, so at small scales, he reasoned that you can't tell gravity and a local acceleration apart. So if you don't believe me, after the, the talk, you, know, you go to the top of your building, wherever you live, and jump off the building. Okay, now, as you're falling off the building, let's say it's a CN Tower, so you've got a lot of time uh, to do the experiment, drop an apple or a pen or something, and you'll find that it's falling at the same rate as you. So there is no force of gravity because the apple is staying right in front of you. You just say, hey, well, look, we're just floating without any forces acting on us. Because you have, in a sense, transformed away the gravitational field. Okay, so there's always sort of a frame in which there's no gravitational field. That's roughly what Einstein is getting at with the principle of equivalence. Now, this principle, which sounds extremely confusing, has a lot of every sort of even earthbound consequences. So let's think about this in a really simple way. Suppose I'm in a rocket ship here at point, uh, point A, and I fire a light beam to the other side of the ship. Now, the rocket ship is accelerating up, right? So it takes some time for the light to reach the other side of the spaceship. So by the time it reaches the other side at point B, the spaceship has actually moved up. So when I hit the other side, it looks like the light has actually been moved down. Now, it actually makes sense, right? Because, you know, the light's moving across, the ship moves up, boom, it hits it a bit lower, right? But if you believe the principle of equivalence, that would say that gravity should bend light. Because this is what it looks like on, on the Earth from the point of view of like a reference frame in which you're seeing gravity. Light should, gravity should affect light. And indeed, that that is the case, okay? So light does, in fact, bend in a gravitational field and that effect has has been studied and there's other effects i you know i mentioned about uh, gps devices and so on clocks move slightly lower in a gravitational field than they do further away from it so if you're a satellite in space it looks like clocks closer to the surface of the earth are moving slower relative to a clock you know if you're up in space it looks like clocks moving a, a bit slower and you have to take this into account in a gps device otherwise you you quickly you know, you lose the accuracy. So when they, you know, the satellites are doing these triangulations to tell you where you are, so you know how to get to the grocery store or the heck you're going, uh, they have to take this into account. The fact that time is ticking a bit slower down here than it is relative to someone out on the satellite. That's a bit nuts, but it, it actually is true. Right, so what would cause things that want to move on straight lines like without any forces, what would cause light to bend? So Einstein was thinking about this. And luckily for him at the same time, well, actually a bit earlier, maybe 50 years before in the 1860s and 1850s, there was a branch of mathematics uh, called a geometry, differential geometry, which was created by people like Gauss and then his student uh, Riemann. So here's a textbook, because we can't read it, but called Introduction to Riemannian Manifold. It's a whole book just about what Riemann was thinking about, okay? and Romanian geometry was the study of curved surfaces. Now, this is really simple. You can do this experiment by yourself. You can take a flat piece of paper, see, like this, and imagine you, you draw two straight lines that are initially parallel, and you try to just keep them moving up and up and up. You see, they'll stay parallel. So they won't converge or diverge. They'll just straight lines will stay parallel, and they won't start bending around each other. But if you take a curved shape like a sphere, what's going to happen there? Well. Initially parallel lines, say you start on the equator, you start to move up, well, they'll converge at the North Pole. So you and your friends start off at the equator and you're looking at each other and you like, we're just gonna walk in straight lines. You're just walking straight lines. At the end, you run into each other and you say, hey, did you change directions? And he says, no, you're the one who changed direction. And then you say, no, you must have turned because I was just going in a straight line. Well, no, you were both going in straight lines, but you both met at the top because a sphere is curved. So, Lines that are trying to stay straight, as straight as they can, they're still, they still appear to be bent. And that has to do with the curvature of the sphere. And in my last example here, I've drawn what you might call negative curvature. That's the, the shape of a, of a, like a saddle for a horse. That's a little hard to imagine, but they'll cause initially straight lines to spread apart. So 
Maybe if you got a horse in your stable or something, if you live on an English country manor somewhere, if you're listening to it, then uh, you can go after the talk and go to your horse or something and then look at the saddle and see how it's curved. And that has negative uh, curvature. There's another very simple example of curvature, which I think everyone would, would accept uh, if you've seen. So suppose you're flying from Los Angeles to Berlin for some crazy reason or to uh, wherever it is you're going. As you know, I lived in England for many years, so I often would fly from Pearson to Heathrow, uh, the YYZ uh, Heathrow, Heathrow trip. Now, if you were doing this flight, if you're traveling in a straight line, why don't you travel all the way across the Atlantic Ocean through the interior of the United States, cross the Atlantic Ocean and straight to Germany? Well, that's a straight line. But of course, if you're like me and you're nervously looking at the flight monitor and you're seeing where it's going, you know, so the pilot doesn't get lost. So you can say, hey, pilot, you go. You know, in case something goes wrong, you can raise your hand and say, hey, tell the pilot we're going the wrong direction. So I'm always looking at that flight map nervously, the whole flight, right? You know, sitting here like this, watching it. And you'll see you actually fly up the Northwest Territories, over Greenland, over Ireland, and you come back down. Why? Well, that's the straightest line. That's the distance. That's the shortest distance. So it looks like a curved path if you kind of force yourself to think of the surface of the Earth as, as flat, but really it's not flat. And intuitively, you understand this immediately because the Earth is kind of flatter around the middle, obviously, right? So to the pilot who wants to take the shortest distance, so they save the most fuel, they want to save money, they want to go on the path which is the shortest distance. So they want to skip the fat part and they want to go where the earth is kind of skinnier at the top and then come back down. So they don't want to spend much time in the middle. They want to go up top and come down. So that's another, I, I'm trying to explain the idea of how curvature causes things which are moving on straight lines to appear to be bent. And that's essentially the idea in general relativity. And in general relativity, Massive objects cause space to be curved, okay? And then objects, so like the Earth going around the sun, want to move on a straight line because there's no forces acting on it. They just want to keep on going on without anyone doing anything to it. But the problem is because the space is curved, it actually looks, their straight line actually is a curved path. So I'm sure all of you guys, many of you have seen this kind of picture of a large mass and you have kind of like a rubber mattress and then someone takes a big round magnet or a big ball of iron, sticks in the middle and then you see the thing gets depressed. And they say, look, the mass has curved the fabric of space time. You think, wow, well, okay, I don't understand what's going on. But really all they're saying is that a large mass will curve the space. And so if you're a little satellite or say the moon or something going around the earth here, because that space is curved, the straightest line path is actually this kind of thing that's going in, a, in an orbit. That's what a straight line would do. So in the absence of any forces, you're actually moving in a circle. Similarly, the Earth going around the sun on the picture on the right, same picture. The sun is bent space time so much that the Earth is just moving on a straight line, but that straight line appears curved. If you sort of look at it from another point of view from the outside, you're like, oh, look, the Earth is moving in a circle. Well, actually, it's moving mathematically. You can describe that as a straight line in a curved geometry, okay? So that's the idea of curvature. So how do you do this? Well, okay, I can't write down this, these equations down. They'd be a little bit complicated. You have to know a bit of math to do that. But essentially, Einstein's equations, which he wrote down in uh, 1915, uh, look like curvature on one side is equal to something which depends on all the matter and all the energy. So those could be galaxies. So if you're trying to describe the solar system, that would be like the sun. That's sort of the main source of energy in our solar system. So you try to describe the sun and then you'd say, okay, what is, what's the curvature which is created by this large uh, massive object? Okay. Now, the really cool thing I should mention, which goes back to my analogy with mathematics before, is that actually Einstein wasn't the guy who wrote down these equations. So it turns out to write Einstein's equations down, he was having trouble because he, he needed to encode something called conservation of angular of, of energy and momentum. And he had to somehow get the equality right so this conservation law was built in and he was getting really annoyed by this. And he had a mathematician friend named David Hilbert, who's very famous in, in pure mathematics. And Hilbert just came up with uh, an equation from a very natural way. He just said, well, think of it as like the result of some kind of optimization problem, which is very natural. It's very aesthetically beautiful from a mathematical point of view. You're trying to optimize something called the scalar curvature. And you can look it up after the talk, just Google 
Einstein Hilbert action. That's what it's called. So indeed, Hilbert was sort of the first guy to write the equation down and then, but he gave the credit to Einstein because it was Einstein's insights that really led to that. It just, see, it's an example of how beauty and it, like some kind of search for aesthetic intuition is what led to the correct equations. So Hilbert's proposal automatically encoded this idea of conservation, okay, in something called if you want this of endurance that you can you can look up. It's it's some beautiful geometric language built in that which encodes this conservation law automatically. It's it's beautiful. Okay, now Hilbert had lots of things aimed after him, so he didn't get any credit, and certainly Einstein deserves that. Right. Okay. So. Let's look at different objects and how they're bent or how they bend space. So you got some like the earth that makes a little bend, bun, bends things. You got a white dwarf, neutron stars. So you can imagine things get bent so much due to this mass that even light couldn't escape. So you're stuck down in this, in this kind of tube down here. And then you try to climb out, but you can't climb out. No matter how fast you travel, can't get out. And that's essentially the idea of a black hole, but I wanna give you more than that. I'm gonna make it worse for you. I'm gonna give you a more precise picture in a few moments. But in fact, you can come up with an idea of a black hole very simply. You can do this just using high school math. So you can say, what has to be the mass of an object and the size of an object so that even light couldn't escape it? Okay, so this is something you can do on an envelope. And it turns out it's given by this formula. So. It says R, the size of an object to become a black hole. So in other words, so that it's so dense that even light couldn't escape, has to be equal to twi two times this G Newton is sort of like a strength of the gravitational field. Okay, don't worry about that. Times M, where M is the mass of the object, divided by C squared. So that C squared is coming because you're saying the speed of light is kind of like the maximum speed limit of the universe. So that's the fastest speed. Nothing can go faster than that. So this thing is so dense that even light couldn't escape. So it's sort of like the light tries to go out, but no matter how, like it's going as fast as it can, but the space is so curved, it never gets out. So in fact, someone named John Mitchell in 1784 discovered this already, although he was using a sort of inconsistent theory of light and gravity. So you can't really trust that formula, but really he got, he got to the same point. Although, you know, people didn't really take it too seriously. It's just an interesting uh, thought experiment. Okay. So there's really two things. Forget G and C. You should be lazy like me and myself and other physicists and mathematicians. We just said everything equal to one. So just said G and C equal to one make your life easier. So R is equal to 2M. So that's sort of a characteristic size of a black hole. When you have a massive object and it's shrunk down to a size that's about twice its mass in the appropriate units, black hole forms. Okay. Now, associated with this black hole is a kind of characteristic strength of the gravitational field. And, you know, if you don't, if you're less familiar with a bit of these equations, that's totally cool. It's something which looks like one over the mass. Okay, so think of that kappa. This is a Greek letter. It's like their K and it's called kappa. And that kappa is roughly the equivalent to, say, on the Earth, that'd be like 9.8 meters per second squared. It's like a local gravitational acceleration. So if I drop, I don't know, my phone or something. I drop this bottle of disinfectant, it'll accelerate down to the ground at 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's that cap is roughly measuring the same thing. Now I'm being a little, speaking very roughly because there's some normalization effects I'm doing there, but roughly that's what that cap means. So there's sort of two numbers you should think about with, with black holes, okay? Now, this is all getting a bit crazy. So let me try to put this in perspective, although <laughs> in retrospect, this sounds like not much perspective. So if I took the sun and you say, hey, how do, how do I make the sun into a black hole? And I say, that's easy. Just squeeze it down so it's three kilometers wide. Okay, so I don't know, roughly like the distance from here to from the center of Hamilton, maybe to the university or something. Just squish it down, it's three kilometers. You got yourself a black hole. Okay, that seems a bit crazy. So how about the earth? You took the whole earth and you shrunk it down to the size of maybe 0.9 centimeters. So that's like, uh, I don't know, like the size of a peanut. So if the whole Earth was squished down to a peanut, it would form a black hole. So it would be so dense that even light couldn't escape, okay? So you have to understand, when you talk about black holes, it's not just about being massive, who cares? It's not about being small. Lots of things are small, okay, they're not black holes. It's about a lot of mass concentrated in a really small region, spatial region. Then you've got black holes forming, okay? 
so someone in the questions I recall asked me, well, okay, how do you see these things? And why do they say black holes at the center of many galaxies? Well, I guess as a result of lots of work of astronomers doing experiments, they have rough consensus indicates that there is a large black hole, like say about a million, roughly a million times the mass of the sun, which sits at the center of most galaxies. So how the heck do you see it if you can't see it and light can't escape is the obvious question. And the answer is, well, I've, <laughs> I don't know this because I'm certainly no uh, experimental astronomer in any sense, but what they do is they look at the motion of stars. Okay, so here, these S's are different stars and these are some crazy things astronomers use to measure how they're moving, but you can see they're moving in these strange elliptic style orbits. And they're all, they all look, and they're all moving in different ways, these complicated ways that roughly it looks like they're all moving around something in the middle and no one can see anything there, but they could see these stars moving because obviously the stars, you can see them, right? So they're all rotating around something centrally. And this phenomena has been observed in many different galaxies. This one I think is, is M87 in particular. This is work I think from 2018. I think uh, this work, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so in any case, that's how you see them by you infer their existence by looking how they gravitationally affect other objects. Okay, so now we get to the nitty gritty stuff, right? So we're half an hour left. I will start talking about some of the details of black holes. Okay, I know I've been going a little fast. Right, so in 1916, a year after Einstein came up with this theory, an astronomer named Carl Schwarzschild, uh, who was an astronomer and physicist in Germany, in Berlin actually, went off to fight in the Eastern Front because there happened to be World War I going along at the time. And he picked up an autoimmune disease, which is pretty bad on the front and came back. And unfortunately was lying in a hospital bed in Germany on his return. Sadly, he passed away, but talk about heroism and you know, being committed to the cause. He just found out about Einstein's uh, theory because he was interested in these things. And you know, at this time, things were sent by letters. So it took three months before you found it anything. You, know, you waited for the journal to come out. It wasn't like instantaneously all the time, information is coming at you and you can't even shut it off for 30 seconds. So back then took, things took time. So he found out about Einstein's paper. He's lying in bed like this from some terrible skin eating disease, autoimmune disease. And he says, okay, let me try to work out a solution of these equations describing a spherically symmetric body. So. If you're, if you know a bit of physics, physicists always, when, they, when they're confronted by hard equations, they look for the simplest kind of thing. Like they pretend a cow is like a sphere, or they pretend the planet is like a sphere. They pretend everything is like a sphere because that's sort of like the simplest kind of equation you can solve. The first kind of solution of complicated equations is to assume things have some kind of symmetry, like spherical symmetry. Okay, so here's, here's a picture of Churchill's solution. So it describes, space-time outside of a star. So here the star is painted kind of in red, kind of filled in, and really Schwarzschild's solution should be taken seriously outside the red area. So if that's the sun, this would describe space-time as felt by the Earth or Mercury or other planets. Okay, and it turns out Schwarzschild's solution describes it utterly accurately, even more accurately than Newton's theory. So it, des it described the precession of the sun, it described deflection of light, and everything is beautiful. There's one little catch is that if you sort of trusted Schwarzschild's solution, even beyond the size, like the radius of the sun, but even further down, there's this funny blue curve, which is what was called the Schwarzschild radius. And it turns out it's exactly at R is equal to 2n, just like sort of Newton's theory would predict. Kind of a strange coincidence, but that's because it has to do more with spherical symmetry than anything else. Uh, in any case, so people were worried because Schwarzschild's solution broke down at that point. And this caused confusion for 50, you know, 50 plus years in the in the physics community and mathematics community, because they just, even Einstein thought this was something crazy or there's something wrong or just some weird mathematical kind of crazy thing. But people said, don't worry about it, because after all, you know, this crazy area, it's far inside the sun. And anyway, Schwarzschild's solution isn't valid there, because then you have, like, you have matter, because there's stars and there's a star there, there's a sun there. So, Schwarzschild solution only describes the outside region where it's vacuum and empty. So don't worry about it. It's not like the star, you don't have to worry about this kind of craziness inside because then that would be valid and you need another kind of solution to describe that. But even by the 40s and 50s, uh, people like Oppenheimer and Schneider were studying, you know, before Oppenheimer started working on the Manhattan Project, he was studying gravitational collapse. Uh, maybe he should have stopped doing that for all I know. But anyway, he, 
he was studying gravitational collapse and uh, he what he showed is that okay if a star collapses even beyond this the outside the red region it can get within that blue region and then you have to take this torsional radius seriously something crazy is happening there so what's going on there well it turns out that describes a boundary between an area from which light can escape and an area from which light cannot escape. So if you shine a light within this blue circle here, it does never gets out. Now it's hard to see that from this picture because this picture doesn't show the, the curvature of space time, but you can trust me, if you looked at the equations, you'd see light can't get out. So let me give you an idea. People often ask me, well, what falls into a black, what happens if you fall into a black hole? So let me give you a quick story very quickly. So you and your friend, the pure macho guy, you know, pure tough guy, pick someone. I'm sure you can imagine someone really bombastic and who likes to talk a lot, sometimes likes to tell, 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 tell. I'm sure you can think of people in your mind. So this person comes along with you and you and your friend go off towards a black hole and you're, you know, you get your space, your space suit on. You say, well, okay, I'm going to go up there. I'm really interested in science. I want to see what it's like to get closer. And he's a step aside. I want to be, you know, I'm a real alpha male here. I'm going to be the first guy to go on there. And you say, well, okay, fine. So he puts on the suit, attaches on the strap to his back and goes out there. And here's what happens. The gravitational field is very strong near the event horizon, but it's not infinite. So you can keep on turning your rocket's engines to stay static outside. You can stay at a fixed radius outside, as long as you don't get too close. Now you'll need, the closer and closer you get to it, the stronger and stronger that force the thrusters have to be, but you know, you got to go to, you know, full power. I want full power, Captain, but you, you just keep on going it and giving her and don't worry, you'll stay outside. Okay. So everything is going fine. And then you say, well, no, I went out a little too far. So I give the giveaway. So then you say, well, in the interest of science, I think we should get even closer. And then your macho friend says, well, I, I'm getting a little tired of this. Let's pull me back in. And then you say, well, you know, really, we're never going to get this close again. We wasted all our fuel. Like, this is our last chance. So how about, you know, through the interest of mankind and humanity, why don't you go all the way in there and send me a signal? And he says, ah, I changed my mind. And you say, well, too bad. And you just snip the cord. And then he falls in. Okay, so he got what he was coming for, because this is a great thing for science. And you win, because you get to escape, right? Now, here's the thing which maybe perplexed people. To the, from the point of view of the of your falling friend, the, the astronomer, he or the the astronaut, he will fall inside the black hole. Okay, that's fine. He passed the event horizon. Things bad things are going to happen to him, but that's cool. He's going to fall in. How about you on the outside? You can. It turns out you can never see that happening. So one way to think of this is, for us to see, a light signal has to come from the event and hit our eyes. Okay. So there's an event which occurs when the, astro the astronaut falls through the hole. But as I said, light cannot escape. So the light signaling that event can never reach the, an external observer's eyes or his detection device or her experimental apparatus, okay? So it'll look like the astronaut will just freeze. You will never get to see beyond that moment. It'll sort of take an infinite amount of time for the light that signals his entry into the black hole to reach your eye. You'd have to wait forever for that light to reach you to get that signal. Now that's a bit strange, but it looks like he's just frozen there. But as far as the astronaut is concerned, you know, they've fallen in. Okay, so this seems a bit strange. You might think, well, how can that both be true? Well, both things are true. That's just, you know, that's the theory of relativity. It's a bit odd. It has to do with people use different coordinate systems for their time. And I guess for the person on the outside to see this event, that person's got to wait an infinite amount of time. And that has to do with something called a gravitational uh, redshift or time dilation effect, okay? So anyway, he gets turned into spaghetti. Why does he get turned into spaghetti? Well, as you fall in, there's tidal forces, okay? So as you're falling in, essentially, say your feet are kind of closer to the center of the black hole than your head. So your feet gets a, get pulled at a stronger force than the top of your head. So that tends to stretch you out. Meanwhile, say your right shoulder gets pulled towards the center and your left shoulder is getting pulled towards the center. So it's feet, they're facing, they're, 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 uh, they're sort of facing a, a differential force. So they're, it's kind of being, you're sort of being pulled in and that's why you know, they often joke you get turned into spaghetti, which is kind of what that picture is trying to comically depict. But essentially 
you feel what are called tidal forces that tend to twist you and squish you in. Now, somebody asking the questions, how long does it take to fall into the black hole? Now, that's a calculation you can do and say if, you, if you're lucky enough or you have a chance to take a course in relativity here, say in McMaster or any, any university, that's the kind of question someone could ask on, say, an assignment or something. And it turns out there's a maximum length of time you can survive before you fall in. And it's equal, well, it's equal to pi times m. So roughly it's proportional to the mass of the object. So the bigger the mass is, so the longer you have time before you hit it, but you have to hit it, okay? Now, let me draw a picture of what black hole sort of is. So here, I want you to think of this picture, you sort of have to rotate it around, it's kind of hard to imagine, but rotate it around. So here we're just sort of seeing kind of a slice of it. So the radial direction points to the right and to the left, okay? So we have the surface of the star, this kind of black line. It's going along. And you shoot a, a, like this green light, it's kind of a, a bit of light, which is inside the star. It just, if it's, sh if it's shot out radially, it'll just fly away to infinity and it's perfectly fine. Now the star collapses and collapses. Now there's gonna be, an, at some stage, it's gonna collapse and shrink sort of up here, at which point these red light rays will start to collapse inside themselves. So they'll become trapped. So they wanna go out, but they're trapped. So you, they start flying outwards, and they get forced. Okay, no sound effect, that's me. But the sound, uh, the light gets squished and trapped back into the center. So they're trapped. And there's a perfect boundary beam of light indicated by the blue, which is sort of like the last ray of light, which doesn't get out, but it's not quite, it's sort of not quite condensed enough so it gets pulled in. So it shot up that, it was, it was sort of escaped at the exact moment before the black hole formed roughly. And that is sort of like what the event horizon is. So it's, 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 just, it's, it's sort of like the last wavefront of light, which was fired off, which can escape to infinity, but sort of takes an infinite amount of time. So this blue line will eventually get to infinity, but sort of like a parabola, it's kind of just going straight up forever. Okay, and that, that roughly is the idea of, of a black hole. And yeah, I yeah, I sort of sort of should say just one more thing about that. If a little bit later on someone threw in a threw in more matter, like another star came along and fell in, or some more stuff falls in the black hole, then these blue lines would start to shift inwards again, because there'd be more mass and they'd be forced to converge by Einstein's equations. And so then maybe it's this green light, which is really the one which gets off to infinity. And you know, which is sort of like the last bit of light which actually makes it to infinity. So what I'm trying to explain to you is that an event horizon of black hole is a very odd non-local thing. You can only understand where it is if you wait an infinite amount of time, because you have to wait forever to see what light rays actually got to you. So then you can say, ah, that's the part which is outside the black hole, and this is the bit which is inside. So you sort of have to wait forever to know where it is. So like I'm no you know, philosopher kind of person, or I don't know any Greek, but this is what's called a teleological definition. It's a definition which is sort of defined for its own purpose. So it seems kind of strange. It's not defined in terms of something else. It's defined by what it does, roughly. So it's an odd thing, the event horizon. Here's another picture, which is called a Penrose diagram, introduced by Roger Penrose, who won a Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for his work on black holes, among other things. And in this picture, light rays always move at 45 degree lines, okay? and you can see here this red or orange area is the surface of the star. So the surface star is all going well, eventually it collapses. So it sort of shrinks and it's moving off to the right. And this white line here, which I discussed, which I've written as the horizon, that's the, a beam of light, which is sort of the last one, which gets to infinity. So all the stuff above that white line here, you see if it's, shoot, if it's shot off at 45 degrees, because all light rays move at 45 degrees in this picture, if it's shot off here, it'll just hit this blue singularity line. Okay, so it'll never escape to this area, which I discussed as, which I described as the infinite future. So infinite future, just think of that, that's where we live. So people who are observers far away, we're sitting there happily far away from the black hole, we're watching. And you know, we realize there's some things which we will never have access to. All these regions inside this horizon, no matter how they travel, they will never get to us. They're somehow trapped. And this is sort of the, the idea of a collapsing black hole. Okay, good. So let me get to the no hair theorems. Uh, you can see black holes are quite complicated. And in general, in a gravitational collapse, uh, they're, 
dynamical, they change in time. So what do physicists do and mathematicians? They say, well, this is too crazy. We're gonna study something simpler, okay? Let's study a simpler problem, which is let's imagine all the stuff on the black hole and then you wait a million years and everything settles down to what we call equilibrium, which is a fancy way of saying they don't change in time anyway. There's lots of ripples, you just wait, things settle down, everything is calm. Let's see if we can understand black holes in, in this setting, okay? Now, even then things would be incredibly complicated. There's two things we can for sure measure from infinity. That's turns out you can measure how heavy or how much energy there is in the black hole. And you can also measure roughly how fast it's rotating. So we can do experiments from far away, calculate these two numbers. But in general, there could be all this other information telling you that depend on the initial conditions of that black hole. There, there should be lots of things which describe a black hole, not just these two numbers. Now, 50 years after Schwarzschild, someone named Roy Kerr, a New Zealander, uh, found a solution of Einstein's equations which described the black hole that, all, that was also spinning. So it was like Schwarzschild's solution, but it actually had an extra parameter, which was telling you how fast it was rotating. That's just parameter J. So now there was a two parameter family of solutions. Now later Roy Kerr actually went on to become a professional bridge player. So he, he'd made this awesome discovery in 1963 and he said, okay, I'm leaving the field. So he went on to, to play bridge after that. Now, one of the people who, uh, I'll move along here. One of the people who made this discovery, I wanna point out is, was named Werner Israel. Now, Werner is a great Canadian and South African physicist, theoretical physicist, and I want to point him out today because he actually passed away at the age of 90 earlier this year. Uh, he was born in 1931. I guess he would, would have turned 91 next week, in the you know, first week of October, actually. So Werner's family, if you can guess from that last name, fled Germany in the early 30s, luckily, to South Africa. And then uh, he moved to Canada in the, in the 1950s and became a professor at the University of Alberta. And his work was on classifying these specific equilibrium black holes. So along with Hawking, this is you know, like one of the great Canadian uh, physicists. He was a member of the Fellow of the Royal Society of, of the UK and a, uh, like a companion of the Order of Canada. So a br brilliant physicist, and you know, sadly he passed away. You know, it's a brilliant catalog of work, uh, Werner Israel. Uh, so anyway, that was a good time to find out this uh, amazing person. Uh, you're less familiar with, with Werner. Um, so in any case, Werner Israel, Hawking, and others in the late 60s and early 70s began to classify this problem. Now, this is a bit heavy, okay? So I'm going to try to do something crazy, which I've never done in a, in a kind of talk like this. I'm going to show you some math. So let's suppose I've got two black holes. One has a mass, M1, and spinning at the rate of J1. And you got another black hole, which looks kind of different. And it's got mass M2 and an angular momentum to J2. Okay, now it turns out using mathematics, we can define something which roughly measures the distance between these black holes. So what I mean by distance is in a more abstract sense, it's measuring how close they are, their geometries are to each other in a more abstract way. And it turns out using Einstein's equations and some sort of heavy duty mathematics, you can find an identity, an equation which says the difference between these two black holes that measure how distinct they are from each other is equal magically just to the difference between their masses squared and the difference between their angular momenta squared. So what this means seems kind of odd, but if M1 was equal to M2 and J1 is equal to J2, if those two parameters are the same, then those black holes cannot be distinguished because that distance, this delta B1 comma B2, this fancy symbol I wrote down, that would be zero, okay? So I know I'm, this might seem kind of strange to people, but if you study a bit of undergraduate physics or math, you know, if you've been lucky to have that chance, you learn something, you learn things like partial differential equations and you learn things called the divergence theorem. This, they're all kind of versions of calculus, okay? So, you know, when you learn this stuff, you say, why are we using, why are we learning this stuff? It's like, ah, it sounds so boring. And, you know, the professor might not have time. She might not have time to tell you why this stuff is so awesome, but you gotta have faith because a few years later, it turns out that tells you something about black holes silly things that you can learn about undergraduate mathematics or physics it has profound consequences about the real world. You know, it's, it's really true. And I can't get into this stuff, but it, it, um, it's, it's beautiful mathematics. It, it really is. It's stuff that should not work, but it, it works. And maybe, maybe that's a sense of, of beauty. Right, so what's no hair theorem? It's what we call the uniqueness theorem of mathematics. So it says that a black hole is completely characterized, or equilibrium one, by its mass and angular momenta and nothing else, okay? So no matter how a black hole was formed, two black holes could be formed totally differently, okay? 
All you need to know is their mass and, and their spin. And if those things are the same, hey, it's the same black hole. So imagine if you could do that with people. Imagine if you could just look at someone, look at their hair color and their skin color and tell everything about them. <laughs> Actually, some people do believe that. Uh, unfortunately, ho fortunately, hopefully most of you don't, <laughs> don't believe that. <laughs> Uh, not, not really funny, actually. So anyway, as far as black holes go, there is a sense that laughingly we say it's no hair theorem because in a sense, they all look exactly the same. Like it says if they're all their heads were completely shaved and they got no skin color and even their eyebrows, nothing. All you need to know is how fast they're turning and how big they are. And then if you know those two things, that's it. That's all you got to know about a black hole, equilibrium one. Okay, so here I get to the end, last five minutes here. I want to discuss why black holes are interesting from the point of view of theoretical physics and why they, you know, you always hear about Hawking and Kip Thorne and Susskind and all these fancy theoretical physicists and why are they studying black holes? Well, I'll try to explain. Well, you can prove that if you vary the parameters of a black hole, just like you vary the parameters in a thermodynamic system, they will satisfy kind of a strange law what we call the first law of black hole mechanics. So it's sort of saying, if you vary the mass slightly, then the area of the black hole will slightly change according to a formula. And you don't have to worry about this omega and this kappa. These are just parameters which tell you roughly the angular velocity of the black hole. And kappa is this kind of local acceleration I discussed before. There's another theorem which Hawking proves is very interesting. He said, he proved that under, under dynamic process, the area of a black hole always increases. So in the early 70s, people like uh, Jakob Bekenstein and, and Hawking, Don Page and others looked at this and they said, you know, what's funny, a black hole looks a lot like a thermodynamic system, you know, because a thermodynamic system has an energy and it has an entropy and a temperature and they satisfy a famous first law of thermodynamics. And there's also a famous law which says uh, the entropy is always increasing. That kind of looks like Hawking's area increase law. But the question is, what's the temperature? And then they said, well, stupid, there's no temperature of a black hole because it's black. It doesn't, you know, a, a hot object like a hot lump of coal or your oven or something like the element of an oven of your stove, it starts to glow. You know, it gets red when it's hot. That's because it's emitting radiation. That's how you know it's hot. That's why you don't touch the stove oven. You'll burn your finger because when it gets red, right, it's, it's getting hot. So similarly, if a black hole had a temperature, it would have to start releasing particles. But it's black. Nothing can escape. I just told you that, right? So I guess this is just some stupid analogy. No, wrong. So Hawking in 1974 showed that using a famous calculation, and I'll discuss this in the question. Someone had a question about this. Uh, he showed that black holes are actually emitting particles. Now, to do this, he did some crazy, fudgy work, the kind of thing a mathematician would never do. They'd never have the stomach for this. But a theoretical physicist kind of pushing the boundaries and kind of, you know, going a little bit, breaking the rules a little bit to make progress can do this. So he combined some quantum mechanics here, took some GR over here, stuck it together, some approximations, and he showed that it has a small temperature. Now, this funny thing, H bar, that you see on the top, that's called Planck's constant. It's a very, very small number that controls the size of the quantum effects, okay? So this is really small. So the temperature of something like the sun is like, I don't know, like 10 to the minus eight Kelvin or just something crazy. You would never measure that temperature ever, but it's there. So theoretically it exists, although in some real sense, it's too small for us to see, but it's actually there. And this bugged a lot of people. If black holes are radiating, then eventually they'll decay. Okay, now why is this a problem? I mean, that's cool, it decays. By the way, there's this picture, a famous picture of black holes. They often say like a, a virtual particle falls in and one escapes. Actually, that picture has, I don't think has anything to do with Hawking's kind of field theory calculation. I don't even know where this picture came up. Actually, it's, the calculation is much different than this kind of heuristic picture you often see. And anyway, so someone tells you that Hawking radiation is like that. It's not quite like that, but. It's even more confusing and strange. So I you know, didn't want to get into that. But we can talk about that later. People are wondering about that. So why is this so problematic? Why is this called the information paradox with big letters? And there's all these people discussing this who sound important. Well, the reason why is if a black hole evaporates, all the information that's sort of stored in the black hole, which sort of des describes all the stuff, how was it formed? And all that information, like how was it created, what kind of star fell in, or how was it collapsed, and all these things, that all disappears because this radiation only contains 
essentially information about the mass and the spin. So it's, it's characterized by just two numbers. So where did all that information go? Now, when in quantum mechanics, we have a name for that, that amount of information. It's called the entropy, which you may have heard of. And a system which doesn't have a lot of entropy is sort of very structured. A system which has a high entropy is roughly very disordered. All that means is that there's many microstates, like many micro, oh, very microscopic uh, configurations which have the same macroscopic qualitative behavior. Okay, so in something called statistical mechanics, we learn how to calculate those things. But you need a theory to do that. So statistical mechanics is kind of like a microscopic theory to explain thermodynamics. And in theoretical physics, we're sort of looking for some kind of theory to explain the thermodynamic laws that Hawking and Bakkenstein and other people have came up with. So Hawking, in fact, predicted that a black hole will have a very large entropy, and he has a famous formula. Roughly, the area is, is proportional to the size of the area of the horizon of the black hole. Okay, So it's a huge number. So if it's something like a black hole the size of the sun, that entropy is like 10 to the 80 or so. Huge entropy. And it makes sense it should be a huge number because there's so much information we don't know about how that black hole was formed. But the problem is if the black hole is evaporating, you see, eventually they'll disappear. And then the question is, well, where'd that information go? And this has some problematic features for quantum mechanics because one of the important fundamental kind of precepts or presuppositions of quantum mechanics is something called unitarity. And that says that information cannot be created or destroyed. So roughly, you can kind of think of it like determinism. If you know all the information here and then you wait in time and evolve the system, that information can't disappear, can't just sort of, it's like a kind of like cosmic accounting. You know, when you're doing the accounting, and then the CRA says, hey, wh what happened to your receipt? And you say, I don't know, I, I just claim it. And then they say, no, we're gonna audit you now. You owe us $10,000. You can't just, information can't disappear about your receipts or something you hypothetically paid for, for some strange thing which you have no record for. You gotta keep the receipts. Similarly, quantum mechanics to make sense, at, you have to keep all this information. It can't just disappear, okay? Now I won't get into this until maybe we get into some questions. So running short of time, and I know I talk too much. But the most recent work in theoretical physics uh, using an idea which is called entanglement entropy, a group of researchers, uh, mostly based in the US, but other places, have, coming, have come to the conclusion that they believe information does get up. That's the latest way this is going. And I remember Hawking giving a talk where he also roughly came to that conclusion. He had sort of some different ideas for, describing this, but in any case, roughly we're moving towards the point where information is not destroyed, okay? But the arguments there are kind of, I would say, on not the most rigorous footing. They're also kind of hand-waving and there's certain jumps and things and some fudge factors. So you don't want to get into that and explain that so theoretically. So before I conclude, I'll just sort of say a few things. Why are black holes interesting? And if you get anything out of the talk, I just want to have these two pictures. On the picture on the left is what you might call like real astrophysical black holes. And I haven't done that subject any just justice. So there's astronomers and astrophysicists, they're just shaking their heads saying, oh, damn it, this guy, he didn't talk about anything. About like, what's he talking about? All this other stuff. He didn't get to anything interesting. And I don't blame you because there's an infinite amount of things to say about astronomy and astrophysics and observations of black holes and gravitational waves. So on my picture on the left, I've explained, classically, they're very simple. But there's so many interesting things to say about them and how they control dynamics and galaxies and formation of things. On the right-hand side, I have this sort of more austere, cold, mathematical and geometrical picture of a black hole. And maybe that's some my own perspective as someone who studies these from a mathematical point of view, or a theoretical point of view. Black holes offer many interesting questions that, that stir research from different points of view. And the point is when you learn about black holes, Roughly, there's such an extreme laboratory, an extreme environment that when you learn things about that, then you can use that to apply to other situations, which are also interesting. And of course, classically, that would be something like the Big Bang. So we'd like to learn about the black, the Big Bang. And the black hole is sort of an interesting extreme laboratory where we can test some of these ideas. Okay, so I'll, I'll conclude there. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And I, I know I've gone really fast and probably jumped over lots of things. So uh, I hope we can touch on some of these things.
in the question. So I'll stop there and thank you, John. Thank you very much, Hari, uh, um, for that enlightening talk, I guess I could say. <laughs> uh, a reminder to audience members, we will have a question and answer period, but if you do have to run, um, you can log off. Uh, we will record the question and answer period so that you can view it later on as well. Okay, uh, we received a lot of questions by email, so I'll try to coordinate uh, ask, asking one question that was sent by email earlier this week and one question that was posted online and see how far we can get down the list. Cool. Uh, and I think you actually did touch on some of them already, so um, mm -hmm. feel free to say I've already touched on that or, or you can add to it if you like. So the first question, um, Will, this came before the talk, of course, will Dr. Kundari talk about quantum entanglement? In yes, so also, let me just say this very quickly. Here you can talk, when we talk about the picture of a black hole, then I'll go over here. So the region inside this blue, uh, yeah, the region inside this blue curve, that's sort of stuck inside the black hole. And the region outside that blue curve is the region outside. So in these, in, in these ideas, these new ideas about entanglement, roughly entanglement is sort of an idea in quantum mechanics which relate two different things. So it's sort of like two things. It's, you can think of it roughly like say the password and the key you need to unlock say something like a bank account. So the password is meaningless and the code that you need to break it maybe could be like the thing you need to send your thing to itself is meaningless, but together they unlock something else, some other information. I know that's a rough idea, but that's kind of what entanglement is. Entanglement is, it's a connection between two things which otherwise on their own is, don't really make any sense, but they're sort of connected. They, together, they store some useful information, okay? And uh, so roughly that's quantum entanglement and that's underneath, underlies these ideas of black hole information. So roughly the idea is that the information inside the black hole is entangled in some non-trivial way with the information outside. And what these people are saying is that as the black hole shrinks, that entanglement will sort of go away. So all that information will get pushed to the outside. And essentially, so that's why the information isn't lost. It's sort of like the entangled entropy sort of moves out of the black hole. So it's not hidden inside anymore. So it wasn't like Hawking was wrong. It was more like perhaps he was calculating something that wasn't quite the right thing. He was focusing just on the outside bit, but really you have to think of this entangled state between the two of them, and then you would get the correct answer. Oh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we have kudos to one of our questioners who sent an email message, a uh, question by email earlier this week. Thank you. <laughs> because they informed our speaker about hot gas bubbles. So kudos to whomever asked that question. Um, but our next question is, how do you assess rotation of black holes, especially when time comes to a stop? Oh, rotation of black holes. Yes. Yeah, so. Now, how do you, okay, so the mathematical question is, how do you compute that? Well, you would read those off somehow from the properties of the space time. So for example, if you, to know that a black hole is rotating, you could sort of think of a small object like a planet or something, or whatever it is, like a test particle, we call it. And you can study how it moves. You know, I said things move on straight lines that they look like curved paths. And from that, you can deduce the angular momenta of a black hole. So that's one way of doing it. But really, when people study the actual spins of black holes, that's actually an interesting astrophysical question. I looked into a bit of this. I, I'm not exactly sure how they do it, but roughly they're they're studying the like the spinning of these accretion disks of these these gas blobs as they spin around, and from there they infer the spin of the black hole from that. So they look at these, they look at all this data, their electromagnetic spectrum data, then they feed that into a computer and they compare that to a model say of a Kerr black hole, which has certain mass and certain spin parameters. They compare the two things and they say, ah, oh, okay. They try to read off the best fit for what the angular momenta of the black hole is. But you raised an interesting point, the questioner, that what does it mean for time to stop? And I, I didn't really say this very quickly. Just if you study the equations, like Schwarzschild geometry equations, you can sort of, you can ask how fast is, is time ticking? So for an observer far away, he looks or she looks at the astronaut close to space. So imagine I could look at that astronaut's watch clicking and I compare it to how fast my own watch is clicking as I'm really far away, safe and sound, far away. 
and it's sort of like six, maybe 10 of my ticks would go off, but a fewer number of the person close to the black hole would tick off. And if some of you guys maybe watched the movie Interstellar, so that was pretty cool, uh, and uh, Christopher Nolan movie. Uh, so he makes confusing movies. But uh, anyway, uh, in that movie, Matt Damon's character is kind of in the spaceship. And then uh, Matthew Bohanicki and the, the other actors, I forget the name. They are on the planet, which has a very strong gravitational field. And roughly, I think how it works is Matt Damon's character, no, it wasn't Matt Damon. You know, he's the crazy guy on the planet. I'm sorry. There's another character who's on the spaceship. I, I forget his name. Anyway, he ages quite a bit, whereas the characters on the surface uh, don't age very much. And that's sort of the idea that a lot of time has passed for the person who is orbiting where the gravitational field is weak, whereas the, the internal clocks, even the body clock itself of the people in the closer, stronger gravitational field was, was ticking slower relative to the person far away. So that they... You know, I think like 25 years had elapsed for the person far away, whereas, you know, just like 10 minutes or a couple of hours had passed for the people at the bottom. Okay, so I screw that up. Go and watch the movie again, and then you'll get the characters the, the characters correct. But that's the idea of time slowing down. So don't, when you hear things like time slowing down, it's more like relative to who? So relative to observer A, observer B's clocks are running slowly. Or relative to observer B, Observer A's clocks are moving really fast. So it's, it's always relative when you think of these things. So that, and, provides, uh, yes. uh, that provides a nice segue to a question that was asked online. But uh, 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 an astute audience member noticed that the image behind me is from the movie Interstellar. And uh, there ah. are several questions along this line. But, uh, so I think uh, I'll read this one. Does Hollywood even come close to visualizing a black hole? Yeah, I, th I think they do actually, but you know, the cool thing is you don't even need Hollywood to do this because people have actually take, taken pictures of these things. This, that's what blew, blew my mind. And I have to be honest with you, when I started saying this stuff a long time ago, I was really cool. I read Brief History of Time, oh, Black Holes is awesome. And I didn't think they'd actually see these things. I thought, yeah, whatever. I just thought it was cool, interesting mathematics and so on. I didn't really, didn't really care that, <laughs> that you could actually see them. Now, I think Hollywood did do a great job in Interstellar because one of the, the people who was involved in that was, was the famous uh, physicist Kip Thorne, who's a well-known uh, relativist and astrophysicist who, who collaborated with Hawking. He works at Caltech. So I think he was a scientific advisor. So there's no joking around there. I think the description of the outside is really accurate. I think when it goes crazy when is when the ship goes inside and then suddenly there's like a four-dimensional tesseract and then the power of love and I don't know what's going on. And then suddenly he's talking with his long lost daughter or something. So things get kind of confusing there. Okay, I don't understand that part. But as long as they're outside of it, I think they describe that very accurately. Now there's one thing about a black hole which sometimes confuses people. And it, the singularity is what we call a space-like singularity. And I think this isn't sort of always captured so well from the pictures because you're outside of it, obviously, right? So a black hole singularity like this crazy thing on the inside where the curvature becomes infinite and essentially accounting stops because you disappear. So at that point, you can't tell what happens afterwards because you literally leave space-time. You're just gone. You've blotted out of existence. So the thing is, a space-time singularity inside a black hole, that isn't a place, okay? It's a time. So it's something you can't avoid. It's like saying five o'clock tomorrow. So suppose you had an exam tomorrow at five o'clock. And you say, how the heck do I avoid it? You can't just walk out of the way or something. You can't like hide underneath your closet. You can't jump on a plane and fuck, well, okay, I guess you can get out of it that way. But you know, it's a time. It's not a place that you can dodge around. And similarly, singularity inside a black hole is a time. You're gonna hit it just like you can't avoid five o'clock tomorrow, or you can't apply it by 9.30. That clock is ticking and hey, we're all aging. It sucks, doesn't it? So similarly, we can't stop time and you can't stop hitting this singularity. So sometimes people say inside a black hole, time and space reverse. But kind of what they're saying is the space becomes like a time. That location becomes not really like something you can just step around, but it's, you can't dodge it. Just like you can't avoid the flow of time. You can't avoid the flow of space inside a black hole. So I, I thought I should just mention that. Um, slightly off topic, but it's important. Well, but uh, 
Uh, actually, it provides a segue to yet another question. There was a question about mm. singularities and black holes and whether they're, they're related to the singularity associated with the Big Bang in any way, maybe properties. Yeah, I think that's a very good question, actually. Uh, I, I looked at this earlier and was quite uh, perplexed and interested by this. So the, the singularity inside a black hole, incidentally, the P, it was Hawking who studied this. So first Penrose was studying singularities of uh, black holes, and he, what, Penrose got his Nobel Prize for it in 1965 for his work. It takes a long time to get it, huh? 2018 or whatever it was for 1965. So he showed that if matter is trapped, like if it gets clumped together, like inside my picture here, inside that, those red lines, then inevitably a singularity has to form. That's something called geodesic incompleteness, okay? So Hawking had watched, I think Penrose give a talk about this, maybe at King's College or Cambridge or wherever, and he had the brilliant idea of kind of turning it backwards. So he said, well, we know the universe is expanding. So could I turn the argument backwards? So if it's expanding now, if I kind of trace these geodesics or these straight lines backwards, and narratively he showed that they have to form a singularity. Now the brilliance of Hawking and Penrose's work is that all the stuff I've been talking about are, is in spherical certainty. You know, that's the physicist pretending the cow is a sphere, even though it isn't. So you could object to a lot of this and say, ah, they just have a lot of symmetry. A cow isn't a sphere. A black hole isn't spherical. The universe is clearly really complicated. It isn't nice and spherical with spherical symmetry. So all this stuff is just sort of like an artifact of these people playing with equations and it's all nonsense. But Penrose and Hawking using ideas from more advanced mathematics like topology and other things, they showed those those results are quite robust. They don't depend on the symmetry. And that's the brilliance of their work. So to get to the actual question, yes, indeed. So the singularity of a black hole is in the future, but it's a space-time singularity, a space like, like I said before, it's like a time. You can't avoid it. And similarly, it's an excellent question. The, the singularity in the past that started the Big Bang is also sort of like a moment of time. But it's, it's in our past. Now, you might say, is it naked? Can I just see it? Like, why don't we see it? It turns out you don't see that because there's something called, um, well, roughly photons were scattering. And I, I guess there's a certain opaqueness. So beyond a certain time, we can't see back in the past. Because so, the essentially things are so dense and light signals it was all so mixed up that things are opaque. It's kind of translucent to, to observation. So we can't really see too far in the past. This is, this is something called a cosmic microwave background. You can look that up if you're interested. So in any case, yeah, to then my question short, the singularity in the Big Bang is a space-like one, which is much like the one in a black hole. But instead of contracting things towards it, it actually explodes. We think of like a time reverse of a black hole. Uh, but it's a, it's an excellent question, actually. And many people try to model, even far going back as back as the early 70s, people try to model the Big Bang by thinking of it for like as a backwards black hole, what sometimes we call a white hole. The white hole is kind of like a time reverse of a black hole where things are spinning outwards. And those got some interest, but it turns out they, you know, cosmologists who know these things, you know, there's many things that doesn't explain. So I don't know, people don't think of it that way. You mentioned Penrose in your talk, and you mentioned it again, Penrose. Uh, so you've joined Penrose because Sir Roger gave a talk in the Origins Institute public lecture series many years ago. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's a great honor to even be mentioned the same name as uh, Sir Roger. Well, and, and the, the link is in the chat for people who are interested. But um, uh, you also mentioned Hawking was watching Penrose deliver a lecture, and maybe there's some hmm. young, budding... Uh, cosmologists out there. So there was a question from Ed about um, uh, outreach. I do astro outreach with grade six students. How would I explain hmm. or describe a black hole to them? Now that's that's really beautiful actually. Imagine if you had say uh, like a waterfall. Okay, so I can't really draw this. Imagine you got a waterfall. This is my arm and the water comes down here, right? So now imagine there's like a current at some velocity and it's pushing the water going this way. So you take, you're in your grade six class and you say, hey, hey, who's the fastest swimmer? So you get the fastest swimmer. I'm not really much of a swimmer myself, so that wouldn't be me. Either. You get the fastest swimmer in there. And that fastest swimmer, imagine, tries to beat that current. But since maybe imagine the thing is kind of sloping downwards, as you get closer and closer to the edge, 
that water starts kind of flowing down quicker and quicker. So there's eventually a place where no matter how fast I'm swimming out, I'm, I'm swimming like, uh, swimming like mad to get the heck out of there. I can't swim out anymore. And I'm just, no matter how fast I swim, I just keep on dragging down and falling off the cliff and then down the waterfall. Okay. Just go down to Niagara Falls and give this a shot. Yeah, you could even try it for real. Maybe that uh, made of a mist or whatever and give this one a shot. Pull full engines, get to the edge. Everyone's screaming. It sounds like fun. And there'll be some maximum loft you get, but eventually you will have to fall in. So the there will be an exact place, say if that, there'll be sort of a place on the boundary exactly where you're exactly balanced. So the speed of the water is, is exactly balanced with how fast you're swimming. And that would be sort of like the boundary. That's like the event horizon where you're going as fast as you can, but you can't get out. At least you're not getting in, but you're right on the boundary. And that's roughly like where the event horizon is. And uh, Otherwise, you're falling in. And it's a really nice question because there are people who study what are called water analogs of black holes, where they, there's even an experiment at the University of Nottingham by someone named Silke Weinfortner and uh, some other people, uh, Silke and others, who are, are studying uh, water experiments. So they're roughly trying, instead of using kind of like the speed of light, it's sort of like the speed of sound and water as a rough upper bound. And they're trying to understand things like Hawking radiation using water. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert of that, but there are analogs of this, which you can kind of think is very roughly following from this idea of water falling down a waterfall. So I think that's a, a decent analogy of what a black hole would be. Try to swim against the current, and the current gets faster and faster, and eventually you can't swim out anymore and just fall down into the cliff. And once you fall down the waterfall, you see you can't send signals up to your friends over here. So the moral of the story is don't swim near a waterfall and just keep the heck out of it. Swim far, far away from any crazy uh, maelstroms or maelstroms or uh, things like that. I, I saw there was another question about grade nine. I assume that's just a bigger waterfall you take them to or something like that. Yeah, they're tougher guys, right? So they, they're topsters. So they give them a little, <laughs> yeah, just put the fear of God into them. So give them a stronger. <laughs> Well, and I'll capture some of those, uh, some of the, the tough people over there. That, that's for sure. <laughs> there, there is an interesting question about one of the phenomena you mentioned. Uh, do photons have a mass or weight? If not, how can gravity affect them? Ah, that's such, a, what a great question, unbelievably. Yes, so do photons have a mass? The answer is no. So they're described by what are called null geodesics or null curves in GR. So these are things which have zero mass. And nothing else, as far as you know, has zero mass. There's things like neutrinos. I think we believe them to have really, really small, really, really tiny mass, electron neutrinos. But let's say for the moment, the only massless things are photons. Yeah, so this, this is why this is such a great question. And it means people actually listen. You know, people really listen to what I'm saying. It's really nice. So remember what I said about Newton's theory. So here there's a formula for the force of gravity acting on like a the force on imparted on mass M1 caused by, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, by a mass M1 and mass M2, the force between them, to be obviously equal, equal and opposite, is related to their product. So obviously if M1 is zero or M2 is zero, then the force is zero. Hey, there's no force. So nothing happens. So nothing, light should not be bent in Newtonian theory because there's no mass. So one of the incredible predictions of Einstein's theory was that, hey, light should be bent. Uh, by by light. Then you'll recall uh, a famous experiment by, I believe, Sir Arthur Eddington led this in 1919, if I'm not wrong. See, I think the experiment was wrong in the end anyway, but anyway, it was true, you know, they got something wrong. But anyway, they did this experiment where during a solar eclipse where the sun was blocked, you could actually measure this deflection of light to some accuracy caused by the sun. And lo and behold, it was actually deflected. So why is it deflected? This is what the questioner is asking. If it's got zero mass, what's going on? And that's the beauty of it. That's the idea which Einstein was getting at, which is central to GR, which is it's not a force anymore. It's not a force because if everything feels it, you sort of can't turn it on and off. It's not like a knob you can turn on and off. And even worse than that, it isn't even like there's negative masses and positive, you know, like a, a charge, you could have a positive 
charge or electric charge, you look at a battery, there's a plus and minus sign. It isn't like that. Everybody feels it. And so if everybody feels it and you can't turn it off, even light, in Einstein's theory of relativity, it has to be something intrinsic to the space time. And that's essentially underlies this idea that's part of the curvature, what we call a manifold. It's a shape which is bent and twisted like a sphere. It's curved. So things are forced to move on this curved sphere or curved uh, manifold, curved by gravity, and they're forced to be bent. And they're, they're always trying to move on straight lines because that, that beam of light just wants to go on a straight line. But since due to this curvature effect, like in my picture here, just think of these two lines on a the sphere, they're forced to contract. So two straight beams of light in a black hole are forced to contract uh, because they're in a trapped region. So that's called the null convergence effect. And you know, the, this is something which is built into general relativity and is a key part of Penrose's uh, uh, singularity theorems. That is a great question. Thanks, I remember asked that. Yeah, there's, um, so there was a question that came up a few times. Uh, what causes the force that keeps the electrons and nuclei apart disappear mm. and the structure of the atoms collapse? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. So they had to talk to a particle physicist. <laughs> so hopefully no one is listening to hear me butcher this question. But as far as I understand, you see the forces which control those sorts of things, uh, I believe, which kind of keep, say, a, a, a neutron, to, or sorry, uh, like an atomic nucleus together, we be things like the strong nuclear force. So this is governed by theory of what's called quantum cone dynamics, QCD for short. And this is a, a well understood, pretty well understood theory. Uh, some things are not known. But one of the odd things about this force is that it's, it's sort of uh, asymptotically free. Uh, roughly what it means is it's kind of, it gets, as you get, as the particles get far away, this the, the strength of the force gets stronger. So they don't want to get too far apart. But as the things get close together, actually the force gets weaker. It's a bit like a string. You know, when you pull a string further and further apart, the force, the tension gets stronger. But if the string is kind of held loosely, it actually, there's no force, it just held kind of limp, right? So the more you pull it, the stronger the force. But the closer it is together, actually there's no force. So the forces that hold kind of like protons and neutrons together inside say like the neutron star or something or a star, those nuclear forces, those are governed by quantum QCD. So in fact, when things get too massive and too dense, actually they don't, they're not strong enough to prevent gravity from collapsing things further. Yeah, and so that's why those forces are kind of very strong. It's very hard to pull atoms apart, obviously. Uh, otherwise we'd have nuclear fusion and we'd have no problem creating energy anymore. And I'll be a big joke. So hopefully someone figures that, that out. Uh, in the meantime, it's very hard to pull these things apart. It requires a lot of energy to break those strings off. But to move them sort of close together, it sort of, in a sense, requires still a lot of energy, but less than you might think. And that's how gravity compresses these things. Uh, for the Just for the sake of everyone's interest, the force of gravity is relatively weak. Otherwise, you know, I'd be falling down the floor of, of this, uh, you know, where I, the, the building where I'm in, because the force of gravity is pulling me down and the, the ceiling and everything on my head, but electrostatic forces are pushing up against my feet that are easily combating that gravitational field. That's why all these buildings are just simultaneously crumbling to the ground because there's other forces. So gravity isn't really a strong force at large scales, it really, at uh, small scales, I'm sorry, but at large scales, that's where it really shows up because essentially all the effects of all these other forces roughly cancel out at large scales. And all you're left with is the one thing which everybody feels, which like I said, is, is gravity. Uh, there, there was a question about the recent audio recordings of black holes. You showed some uh, music in your talk and somebody was ah. interested in your, your um, interpretation or insights on the recent audio recordings of black holes from the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh. oh, I see. So these are, with these, Okay, I hadn't heard these. I, I have a feeling with the chirps, which are caused by uh, the ring down or you know, the, what happens when black holes collide, sort of as I've drawn in this picture. So the famous one I'm thinking of, maybe it's a little different, is when these two black holes collided, they released gravitational waves. And the, the scientists in the, the LIGO experiment who, who did these, who uh, discovered the gravitational waves in 2016, one of them converted that into a sound and that created kind of like a chirp. So that's sort of 
if you converted that into an audio or a signal that our ears could hear, it creates a little chirp like this, which is telling you that's the strongest signal when the the black holes collided, they sent off these these waves. But I'm less familiar with the with these new ones. I, thank you. I'll, I'll certainly check that out. Actually, see, this is my problem. I'm always looking at these equations. I don't I don't even keep up with all the the cool things going on in the world of, of black holes until you know someone at one of these talks tells me, uh, kicks my butt into gear. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, audience members are giving you homework to do. Yeah, I know they definitely are, which is good. Uh, you mentioned a, a, a relationship, with, or I even did in your introduction uh, to st string theory, and um, mm. some audience members were curious how you relate string theory to your research. Ah, that's a real question. That's indeed a lot of the work I do comes from that. So, okay, it's a shameless plug. So, in string theory, it turns out to get a theory which describes gravity in a quantum sense. This, there were some people put this point of view up in the 70s and it was revived in the 80s and you know it's gone a certain direction, who knows where it's going, but it's a fairly well-developed theory. And in this theory, um, black holes arise, but in fact, it's predicted that there's extra dimensions. So for some consistency reasons, you need these extra spatial dimensions. And a lot of my own research is in studying how these no hair theorems I talked about, how do they extend into more than three spatial dimensions. So that sounds like kind of a crazy question, but it's interesting from the string theory point of view, why? Well, I'll tell you why, I think connecting to my talk. So remember when I said uh, a black hole is a bit like a thermal system. So in thermodynamics, you guys know like ideal gases and things like this. People had a pretty good understanding of how to describe a thermodynamic system in the 1860s and 1870s, but they didn't understand kind of a microscopic understanding. So how does that actually come up from fundamental laws, from microscopic dynamics? You know, you, you sort of know how it looks like from the outside, it's got a temperature, you know, you touch it, it's hot, it's got an energy, it's got an entropy and heat, and, and it's got a spin and a pressure and you calculate these things. But where does that actually come from, from some like dynamical understanding at the level of the equations? And that's what statistical mechanics does. So people like Planck and Einstein and other people any people, Gibbs and other people, they came up with a theory of thermodynamics, of statistical mechanics. So similarly, string theory is a kind of theory and it, it supplies a statistical kind of account for these, for the entropy of a black hole. And in many cases, in some nice simple cases, string theory has come up with the entropy and explanation for things like temperature and entropy of black holes from a quantum mechanical argument. Okay, now it turns out these, in string theory, these um, these descriptions kind of rely on certain approximations and you can argue with them, but at least in the field, they're pretty well accepted. This is the work even going back in the late nineties by Strominger and other famous theoretical physicists, Maldacena, Witten, even Hawking was involved. You may have heard of some of these people. And uh, that's a very well developed understanding of string theory. In fact, one of the reasons why we believe in string theory is that uh, one of its big achievements was to supply a statistical derivation of that formula S equals A over four. So you can actually calculate that in string theory, calculate that S, and you find lo and behold, it's equal to the area over four. So how you would do this, I know this might be going on a bit, but basically in string theory, black holes are described by configurations of strings. So if you all these strings are configured in a certain way, it turns out just to a sum of observer, they look like a black hole in certain limits. And you merely have to calculate the number of ways these strings can arrange themselves. If you count those, that'll be exactly this entropy number. It's a number of states which make up a black hole. So there's a way in which you can, that is some hand waving and hand jumping, but a pretty robust calculation of that. And that's why that's the connection between black holes and string theory. It's sort of, it's kind of like a theoretical laboratory to explain, to give a statistical account of some of these thermodynamic ideas, which come from classical general relativity. That's kind of like a stepping stone between classical relativity and quantum gravity. There's something in between a murky land. And like I said, I think this is a good metaphor. When you're trying to push knowledge further, you have to kind of step outside of what you know into the domain of what you, know, what you don't know. You, you have to do this. And then it, you know, you, you're allowed to make some jumps because you're you know, in, the re in the realm of where 
things don't quite make sense anymore. You're allowed to do that and you should be guided by your intuition and you know, you hunch or at least some mathematics uh, to do that. Now you could be totally wrong, of course, and basically most ideas are garbage. So probably all your ideas are wrong, but you know, sometimes you hit on something good. So I think string theory is something good in, in its connection with uh, black holes. And I, I know you said time stops, but um, it runs for us. Uh, are you okay for a few more questions? Or? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, okay. it's nine to five. And, you know, sorry to bore people. Hey, eh, if you got to go oh. and do things, and, uh, okay. I see this is all online, so no one can offend me by just shutting off. And, <laughs> but if people have questions, hey, I'm, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy. Anyone cares. It's nice to be listened to. And, uh, <laughs> that people show interest. It's you can't believe it, right? Who would? Like I said, why aren't you watching the Jays game or something? I'm glad you're. To me. <laughs> so here's a, um, an intriguing one. Um, you mentioned this uh, information cannot be destroyed. Uh, what do you conjecture is the fate of information that enters black hole? Yeah, this is a really good question. So again, this, this is coming from people in string theory and other people, although they're arguing that their results don't depend on details of these things. And probably they don't, uh, but it's hard to tell. <laughs> but in any case, the, uh, what happens to the information so as, as far as I understand, in Hawking's original calculation, everything gets sent out as this random kind of heat information. So what we call a, like a distribution of a Planckian distribution. So roughly you can't tell anything. It's just random noise, roughly. You can't tell anything from it. And so it's a bit, it's a bit like burning a newspaper and all you got left are these, the smoke. And well, how can you recreate the news of the day from that, you know, you can't, how can I recreate Donald Trump's tweet or whatever truth from this burned embers of the newspaper? I can't do it, so my life is over. So suppose I can't do this. Uh, so what, this is sort of odd from the point of view, like I said, in quantum mechanics. So what is that information? So the idea that people are thinking of now, as far as I know, is through this entanglement entropy, it's, that information is somehow stored in that radiation in a very odd way. And what you need to do is create some kind of, what you might say, I think a quantum computer or something, which could then de-encode, disentangle that entangled information and read it off. Now, how they do this, I think this is quite speculatively vague. So I certainly am not an expert on how you would encode that, but it's somehow stored in that radiation. Although, in the Hawking's naive or Hawking's calculation, it's certainly not naive, but in his calculation, that radiation only depends on one parameter, say M, and it looks like one over M, his temperature formula, right? If you get rid of all these factors, one over M. And, and so all you know, if you look at the temperature, all you can conclude from that is the mass. So how would you know all this other information, like what went into it? And if I threw the Encyclopedia Botanica into the black hole, what happened to that information? How would I you know? know all this interesting stuff that's in the Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia, or God knows what else that I threw in there. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, that information is somehow stored in radiation, but exactly how, to be honest, I don't know. And I don't think the people who are doing this, which is, they don't know yet, but they're working on this, on this problem. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, why do black holes form a disk? Oh, yes. Yeah. So this is the so-called accretion disk, I believe, if I, if I have this right. So this is sort of what you see. So in these pictures of black holes, and I think I had a couple here. I, I got one at the end. There you go. So this picture of a black hole, maybe this accretion disk is roughly kind of this hot gas that you see on the outside. So. In a real black hole, there's things like magnetic forces and other fields turned on, not these high, highly idealized mathematical ones I've been talking about, but real world black holes. And so these forces cause particles to accelerate. Now, as they're accelerating, an accelerating charged particle actually releases radiation, like a, like a Bromstrahlung effect, I believe it's called. So as they're accelerating, they emit particles they release energy and that's the kind of thing you can see in the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can do experiments and you can also see them in the radio spectrum, I guess, radio waves. So in the EM spectrum, you can, you can see 
that acceleration. That's roughly what this disk is. Now, why is it shaped like a disk? Well, it kind of makes sense because it's spinning. Things tend to clump along sort of like a, a disk, like a pancake disk-like shape. It's a bit like, you know, rings around Saturn or something. So it's just more natural that things will configure themselves along the rotation in this way. Because if they were sort of down here, they'd be pushed up or they'd fall in or they'd sort of escape away. So that it's kind of naturally sits in a two-dimensional plane like a disk. And that's the accretion disk of a black hole. It's sort of gases and other particles. And generally, when you see astrophysical black holes, as far as I understand, they often come in pairs, what we call black hole binaries. So oftentimes, it could be a black hole, which you can't see. And then you see one poor little star, a sad star, which is rotating around this black object. And it's continually losing stellar material, which is gas. You can think hydrogen gas and stuff. It's losing material to this black hole. So you see this kind of swirl around the black hole. And that's all the gas that's kind of stripping off its binary star companion. And that's what's sort of forming this halo around it. Hey, the, um, there, there's an interesting question about limits. Um, is there a limit to how much material a black hole can ingest? Yeah, that what a great question. So I was actually, I'm not totally clear about this either. So there is no limit. So as far as I understand, there's no theoretical limit that says, well, okay, once you get a black hole gets this big, then okay, you're too big and that's too bad. There's no upper limit on this thing, on a black hole. It can be as big as you as you want. And this is a bit interesting. As far as I know, this is a bit odd. Uh, this is a bit strange. I'm certainly no astronomer or astrophysicist, but I think there are limits to size of stars. Like, you know, you get over maybe 100 times the mass of the star or something. Like stars don't get so big. There are some kind of upper limits on these things. But black holes can get as big as you like, and indeed, the one here in this picture, this M87 star guy, he's, uh, I think that one is like 6 billion, 5 billion times the mass of the sun. Now, a very good question related to this is how do they form then? So if stars can't get really much bigger than say like 100,000 times the mass of the sun, how the heck do you create a black hole which is a billion times or a million times the mass of the sun? I don't know. So that's an unknown question. How do these supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, how do they actually form? So presumably it's like a lot of things colliding together or several black holes forming. Or I'm not really sure, actually. It's, it's a good question for, uh, for a real astrophysicist to answer, perhaps. <laughs> like, how do these supermassive black holes form? I think it's still an open, interesting research question. My, my apologies to the person who, who asked that question. It was my next question on my list and you answered it already because uh, it was a question. Uh, about, uh, we are confident about the formation of stellar mass black holes, but not supermassive ones. So you, mm. you read somebody's mind in the audience. Um, it was such a good question because I didn't know that either. Actually, I'm glad <laughs> someone asked it. Because I, I also said, well, I, I guess there's no optimum because I know black holes get billions of times times the mass of the sun. But then it struck me, well, okay, how do you get something that big if, because, you know, the usual picture, as I've shown this toy model, gravitational collapse of a star. Well, if a star, if you can't find a billion times mass of the sun's star, then how the heck do I get a billion times mass of the sun black hole? It's, it's a good question, actually. And I'm sure probably the next, hopefully, 20, 10, 20 years, we'll get an answer to that. Yeah, it's crazy, actually. Um, there's a historic question. How has our understanding of black holes changed since they were first postulated? Mm, that's brilliant. It's a brilliant question. Uh, I slightly alluded to it as we went along. So uh, Schwarzschild, by the way, his name actually means black shield. If you can read Schwartz in German is black and shield is shield, I guess. So, But by shield, I mean like a crest of arms. Kind of, that's sort of what it means. So in any way, there's a lot of historical fact that his name is Schwarzschild. Um, so anyway, Schwarzschild's solution that he found in 1916 was not even considered to be a black hole until far later, like until the 1950s. So even until then, no one took it seriously, least of all Einstein or, or anyone else. So if you talk about improving our understanding of black holes, that is a great thing. Think about that 50 years after they discovered no one even, whatever, they weren't even called black holes. And I think the term black hole was coined maybe by John Wheeler, who's a well-known American theoretical physicist, I think kind of in a jokey sort of way. So not even really 
flippantly. Then later on in the 60s, people, uh, astronomers would discover things called quasars. So these were very far away objects which were, you know, sending off huge bursts of energy that we were detecting using uh, radio wave detectors. And then, so people began to wonder in the 60s, well, maybe these quasars, they were called, uh, maybe these things are produced by gravitational collapse of the kind which would lead to things like these weird black holes or it is that Schwarzschild and Oppenheimer and Schneider and other people had theorized about. So then it was only by the early 60s that astrophysicists and relativists got together. The relativists were happy because finally someone took them seriously, right? Because otherwise no one took them seriously for anything. They're just a bunch of weirdos studying these equations. The astronomers were happy because maybe they had, hey, maybe there's an explanation for something which we don't understand, right? So this is awesome. So they got together and uh, and that's where sort of the modern theory of black holes was formed. And Penrose at the time was a mathematician studying topology and algebraic geometry, I think, in Oxford or Cambridge at the time. And he, uh, you know, he began to study this from a more mathematical perspective. So all these things, that's sort of roughly how our understanding of black holes started to grow. And then by late 60s and early 70s, the work of Israel, as I mentioned, and Hawking and Robinson and Penrose and other people, Zur and other people then began to really develop a bunch of results in the 70s. And then by the late 90s, sort of, sort of mathematically minded people and geometers, once again, sort of returning to the problem of black holes. Uh, and they began to come with some really, you know, trying to put these things on a more rigorous footing again. And and so I would say things have really evolved quite a bit. And the, the most recent jump of our understanding really must be the discovery of gravitational waves. I mean, that, that is a complete game changer out of the blue. I talk about, you have to believe in something to see. You know, they say, you gotta see something, it's gotta be seen to believe. Well, this is something you gotta believe to, you gotta really believe in it, something to go begging someone for millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars instead of spending it on something else Alzheimer's research or heaven knows what, let's spend it on this theoretical prediction of Einstein's equations of gravitational waves. Imagine trying to convince someone of that. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. You'd have to be a wonderful spinner of stories to do that. And somehow someone actually listened to these people and they, the LIGO and LIGO people are, and they produced these gravitational wave experiments. So I would say that's the real leap forward is that we're in a new era of black holes where they can actually be observed you know, using gravitational waves. That opens a whole new, you know, realm, a whole new vista of observing these things. So it's not theoretical anymore. So people like me, you know, we're going to study these things anyway because it's cool equations and we can have fun saying things about them. But, you know, more serious people will say, why the heck are you studying these things if they're not real? They're real. And then, of course, in 2019, we had this event horizon a tele, uh, telescope. There's someone in Canada at the Perner Institute in Waterloo, uh, Avery Broderick, I think his name is. If you're interested in his work, I, I believe he's part of this, part of the project. He's quite closely into it. So if those of you are interested, maybe you can go see his website. And you can learn more about the Event Horizon Telescope and how you know his contributions to producing an image of, of this kind. Now, things have really changed a lot in 100 years. 20, 1915, general relativity gets written down. 2022, we're getting images of them and we're starting to see uh, you know, gravitational wave observations of black hole collisions are now becoming, like it's not even a surprise anymore. It's like, ah, oh, whatever. But really it's, it's an amazing thing that, that we can do that. And I suppose in some sense, we're learning more about their distribution. There, there was a question about, um, are there black holes in, in every, every galaxy? Mm, I believe there are now. This is the, well, I believe, what do I know? But <laughs> it is believed by people who actually know these things. I was looking this up yesterday because I didn't know. They are believed to be quite ubiquitous, uh, although you can't see them. So why would you believe them? Well, yeah. as I was saying, we, we often see this situation where we're, we're watching the orbits of things and it doesn't make sense because it looks like stars are orbiting, making crazy elliptical paths around things you can't see. Okay, so... And perhaps they're candidates for things like dark matter. People may have heard of these sorts of things. But um, and in any case, they're believed to be the center of most galaxies. As far as I understand, that's what sort of the galactic astronomers are, are saying now. That they, 
exists at the center of most galaxies. There's a big one at the center of every one. And I noticed there was a, a question that occurred many times. One uh, item was from a student in our collaborative graduate program in astrobiology, Nick. Um, and it has to do with the evidence for the existence of other theoretical space, uh, space time, time space phenomena. Uh, you mentioned white holes, uh, things like that, and mm. holes. Are there any? Oh, that's so awesome. Well, thank you for asking that question. Because then we can talk about things that I know more about. <laughs> so what is what are these sort of strange objects? So I've purposefully not drawn any of these pictures of, of these things. So let me move to this Penrose diagram. So this Penrose diagram is kind of, you can't, we don't really have a, a good, well, I guess there's solutions of life science equations which describe this, but this is sort of an idealization of what we think a gravitational collapse looks like. But the actual Schwarzschild solution, which I, as I wrote down here before, this is this spherically symmetric solution of Einstein's equations. And it also has a property which is, I alluded to before, it's an equilibrium solution or it's time dependent, a uh, time independent, it's static. So it does not evolve in time. So one thing about Einstein's equations is that they're sort of time reversible, okay? So if there's something that happens in the future, there's sort of, you can send T to minus T and you get kind of like the time reverse image of that. So if you sort of look at what we call the eternal black hole or in fancy language, the maximal extension of the Schwarzschild solution, which was discovered by someone named Crisco, who's 60 is a mathematician. So this Crisco solution, think of it like, you take the source of solution and you say, I'm going to just push it as far as I can go. I want to, I'll go in until I can't go anymore, it turns out. I extend it as much as I can and just see how crazy things are. It turns out you discover these other objects, not other objects, but within that source of solution, there's other regions. And one of them is a white hole, which is kind of like a time reverse of the black hole. You see, it had to be there because if you've got a black hole, Einstein's equations will tell you, well, there has to be a time flip of that. Yeah. Now, the reason why you don't see this in the collapse picture is because you say, ah, but in the past, there was a star. So you don't use Schwarzschild solution at negative time. There's another solution, like a star existed. So we're not using the Schwarzschild vacuum solution anymore. We're using a solution describing a star with a perfect gas, a perfect fluid or something. So we you don't usually, when you describe a real black hole collapse, we don't use the full sorts of solution. But if you just kind of throw it all away and think of this more mathematically, you will get this backward solution, which describes a white hole. And you describe, you get something called a wormhole. So what is a wormhole? Well, it turns out when you, when you describe, when you study this full black hole picture of, uh, of uh, this full extension of Schwarzschild, it turns out there's another inaccessible region, another asymptotic region. So there's one region on this side that you can escape to. Turns out if you sort of go through the black hole, there's another region which is causally disconnected between each other. So there's no way these two regions can send signals to each other, but they're connected through something called the wormhole. So what the heck is a wormhole? You're saying, hey, guy, what's he talking about? So a wormhole, is something which sits in the Schwarzschild solution. And you can kind of think of it like a bridge which connects these two disconnected regions. They look disconnected, but so there's like a little bridge in between. So why am I saying they're disconnected if they're connected? What's, you know, what's he talking about? So it turns out those equations cannot be passed through an observer like, like us or a beam of light. So roughly, you know, let's just say in these pictures, time always moves up. So we always have to be moving up in the pictures, but the wormhole is kind of tilted sideways. So we'd have to kind of tilt ourselves this way to, to kind of pass, to go through that highway, the wormhole highway. But we were sort of always forced to go up. We can't move more than 45 degrees in the picture, right? Because we can't go faster than the speed of light. So to go through a wormhole, you know, if you ever saw that uh, the Star Trek uh, spinoff, uh, Deep Space Nine or, you know, there was a wormhole in that. Well, okay, you can't go through it because you have to be moving faster than the speed of light. So there are solutions, people, you know, just for fun, Kip Thorne and other people, they kind of come up with solutions of Einstein's equations, which describe a wormhole, which is tra tra transversible. But all these solutions, they always describe some kind of, you need something very unphysical, which doesn't make sense. So it's sort of like to go through the wormhole, you have to invent something else, which is crazy. So really wormholes, I would say, are the domains of, 
uh, fiction, as far as I know, that maybe, you know, who knows, 100 years from now, someone's going to find a wormhole that you can go through, and I'm going to look stupid. So hopefully this video doesn't exist by then. It's turned into uh, Hawking radiation by then. So the, but I think just to summarize, I've talked to blah, blah, blah. Just think of it, it's a, it's a mathematical idealization of wormhole, which follows from the mathematics of Schwarzschild solution, or indeed Kerr's solution. So you can get these other universes and they're predicted mathematically, but in a physical situation, we don't take them seriously, but they're more like interesting mathematical curiosities that one can study. And weirdly, they're kind of showing up back up in these arguments that people are using in quantum entanglement. So things like wormholes are popping up again uh, by these theorists who are trying to understand what happens to information, but I would say it's highly speculative. So, you know, boring people like me who just study these ice size equations probably shouldn't, <laughs> will never touch those things with the 10 foot crowbar because we'd be too scared. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed uh, the student from our collaborative graduate program in astrobiology posted a link to a video. Thanks, Nick, uh, for a brief description, I guess a video description of wormholes. So, oh, cool. Okay. Well, I will. Take a, I'll take a look at that myself, actually, because I'm interested. Maybe, you know, I'm not sure if I get a chance later on to talk with some of the members of your group. I think we can organize that. I'll, I'll love to talk more about wormholes because they're really interesting. Uh, absolutely interesting. <laughs> but, uh, I'm just afraid there might be some real astronomers and other physicists out there who are going to be rolling their eyes and uh, what the heck is this guy talking about wormholes? So I have to pretend to think that they're not interesting. But believe me, mathematically, they're, they're really interesting and you can visualize them and uh, it's it's really beautiful actually okay we have time for one more question if you're up there. yeah sure of uh, course yeah absolutely we've been talking about grand scales but there's a, an interesting question about uh tiny scales uh, what, what are or are there such thing as micro black holes yes i believe they're they're often considered to exist because you in, in fact i think a long time ago people thought black holes would form even could be models for even particles and things like this. You could, although that was eventually, you know, it was shown that was inconsistent with other properties of particles. So that idea was thrown away. So a microscopic black hole would be one which is very tiny, perhaps formed at the level of a Planck scale or something. So these are effects which only show up when you're looking at very high energy scales. So in other words, saying that is at very short distances. So these ones I know less about, but I believe they, they're they thought to exist in situations with very high energy. So those could be in, say, the early universe. So I've seen some people discuss about these things uh, speculatively. And also, you'll remember when the Large Hadron Collider in CERN got switched on maybe a decade ago, you know, there was some speculation that they'd form a microscopic black hole, one of these things, and they would grow and just eat the entire Earth or the universe or something. And then, you know, people did calculations and said, don't worry about it. It's, it's not going to happen. Uh, although that led to thousands of papers. At least someone got something out of it. <laughs> they could write lots of papers on these microscopic black holes. So certainly it's an interesting theoretical prediction, but, you know, you will never see them, obviously, because I guess there's a time scale for their existence and it tends to be very short. Okay, so they, they shouldn't, like even if they existed, they will kind of evaporate or disappear very quickly. Whereas the scale of Hawking radiation is like 10 to the 70 seconds. is because they're radiating so slowly, it'll just take forever for it to, exp to evaporate. So these ideas of evaporation, they're of a very theoretical nature. You're not like real black holes are not gonna be evaporating before our eyes. They're not going anywhere. If they're there, they've been there for a billion years and they're gonna be there for another billion years. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. I, I think remarkably you've answered almost every question. There are some lingering ones, but uh, so my apologies to those uh, whose questions. We will try to get you answers if we can. Uh, but thank you all for your questions. Uh, as always, you do us proud. Uh, you've really tested our speaker this evening. So, uh, and of course, to our speaker, we give great thanks for uh, an illuminating talk, I guess I could say. Uh, we really appreciate it and look forward to interacting with you again in the future. Uh, thank you all for attending this evening and hope to see you at our next event.